with every peace talk, Israel has cemented its occupation. Jerusalem is not a settlement, it's our capital. Crushing dreams of peace and Palestinian statehood. My guest tonight, however, thinks old maps, the Jewish state colored light, the Arab state dark, can still create new borders. But is he stuck in the past? I'm Mehdi Hassan, and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head to head with controversial author and academic Norman Finkelstein. He's been called a self-hating Jew by some supporters of Israel, and having once been a rock star of the pro-Palestinian movement, he's now attacked by many for his refusal to back a boycott of Israel. Today, I'll challenge him on how he can still believe a two-state solution is possible and why he's dismissed the boycott movement as a cult. I'll also be joined by Salma Kami Ayoub, a leading Palestinian activist and human rights lawyer in London, Jeff Halper, the director of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions in Jerusalem, and Oliver Kam, a columnist for the Times of London and the Jewish Chronicle. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Norman Finkelstein. A controversial figure, he's the author of several books, including The Holocaust Industry and How to Solve the Israel-Palestine Conflict. Norman, your new book is called How to Solve the Israel-Palestine Conflict. Given the US Secretary of State, John Kerry, is the latest person to have tried and failed to do so, what makes you think that you have the solution to this conflict? Well, first of all, uh, Secretary of State Kerry did not try to solve the Israel-Palestine conflict in a way that's reasonable for both sides. He's basically, or has been basically, trying to impose the Israeli position on the Palestinians uh, my own view is there's a reasonable possibility for solving the conflict. Uh, there's enough international support for it. There's enough uh, popular support for it. And now the key is for the Palestinians themselves to mobilize in favor of that international consensus. Which is? Uh, basically, it's what it's been for the past 30 years. It's two states in the June 67 border and what's called a just resolution of the refugee question. The Palestinians, as you well know better than me, uh, mm -hmm. first said that they would back a two-state solution back in 1988. Since mm -hmm. then, over the last quarter of a century, we've had the Madrid Conference, the Oslo Accords, the Y River Memorandum, the Camp David Summit, the Tarva Summit, the Roadmap, the Annapolis Conference, mm -hmm. and lately, the John Kerry Plan. None of them managed to bring about a two-state solution, and yet you say that's the most likely option. In what fantasy world is this two-state solution ever going to happen? There's a huge a reservoir of support for the Palestinians. And the reservoir has now extended and includes, for example, I think, large segments of the American Jewish community, which has grown disaffected from the state of Israel. And there are real possibilities of reaching American Jews as well. Let me read to you what Professor Rashid Khalidi of Columbia University, one of the world's leading Palestinian intellectuals, he says the two-state solution is now, quote, Wizard of Oz stuff and that people on the pro-Palestinian side, like yourself, who still cling to a two-state solution, he says, quote, need to have their heads examined. Mm -hmm. Well, if that were the case, then you'd have to say there's no possibility for any reasonable resolution of the conflict, because if um, the two-state settlement, as it's supported by the international community, if that is Wizard of Oz stuff, then one state is Man on the Moon stuff. So you have two possibilities right now. There is the two states as has been embraced by the international community, and then there is the, what you might call at this point, the Kerry Initiative, namely imposing Israel's bottom line, the Palestinians. One state is not part of the debate. Many people would argue that the two-state solution, yes, you can vote on it every year in the UN Assembly, mm -hmm. you can win over American Jewish support, but the reality is that the facts on the ground have rendered it impossible, unviable. There are now too many Israeli settlements, too many Jewish settlers, too many Palestinians, all stuck living together in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and it's too late to disentangle. It's too late to unscramble the omelets. The Palestinians, during what were called the Annapolis negotiations in May, 9, in May 2008, they did present which were, what were, I would say, were very reasonable maps. 
They presented the map, for example, which showed Israel can keep 60% of the settlers in place, 60% of the settlers in place in 2% of, uh, of the West Bank. And the Palestinian state would remain uh, contiguous, it would remain a, a, a viable state. So, so you uh, genuinely believe mm -hmm. that half a million heavily subsidized, mm -hmm. heavily armed Israeli settlers, many of them religious fanatics, mm -hmm. will just leave without a peep no, to bring I, about this two state absolutely solution? Absolutely not. They won't leave without a peep. And there you have to know the details. Like Tzipi Livni, who was then the foreign minister, she was in charge of negotiations. She didn't deny it was a reasonable map. She said, it's not that your map is physically impossible. She said it was politically impossible. That is to say, no Israeli prime minister could support such a map and still remain in office. The problem is not one of physics. The problem is one of politics. Well, let's go to our panel uh, who are sitting here listening to you speak. Jeff Halper uh, is the founder and director of the Israeli Committee mm -hmm. Against House Demolitions in Jerusalem. Uh, Jeff, when Norman says it is reversible, it's not irreversible, what's your view on that as someone on the ground who, who faces these issues every day? Well, we've said for a long time um, that it's irreversible, in my view, um, what's happening on the West Bank. And that's why we think the two-state solution is gone. It's, it is reversible, it's true, I agree with Norman, logistically. There's only a half, you can look at it this way, there's only a half a million settlers in the occupied territories. Only. It's possible to move them. What's missing is the will to do that. And that's the problem. If there was a concerted will on the part of Europe and the United States to say to Israel, look, it's over. You go back to the 67 borders period, it's doable. That's true. But that will is absolutely missing. Okay, let's bring in Oliver Cam, who is a columnist and leader writer for the Times of London and for the Jewish Chronicle. Uh, Oliver, you've had your differences, I know, uh, with Norman Finkelstein in the past, but on this, am I right in saying you agree with him that a two-state solution is still possible and the most likely outcome? I think it's possible, and I certainly uh, believe it is um, overwhelmingly the most desirable outcome. Any other outcome is extremely uh, destructive. The problem is that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not merely a disagreement over borders. It is, and I do agree with Norman Finkelstein on this, it is about politics rather than, uh, rather than the physics of it. Um, the problem is that there have been proposals for a two-state settlement, 2000-2008, um, nothing has come of them, and the two-state solution on which there is a large international consensus, something approximating the pre-1967 armistice lines, um, is now being deferred again because of politics within both sides. And a US official told an Israeli newspaper a few months ago that the Kerry plan fell apart, quote, the primary sabotage came from the settlements, he says. Uh, yes, I, I'm not going to defend the, uh, the settlements, but I don't think that the settlements uh, per se are an obstacle to a two-state solution. One can perfectly well see with land swaps um, whereby 80% of the settlers um, uh, remain in place um, that, there's a, um, uh, that there's the possibility of a two-state solution satisfying the national aspirations of both parties. And do you think 80% of the settlers should be allowed to stay under your vision of a solution? Well, again, you keep personalizing it and saying my vision of well, a solution. You, 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 you've co-authored a book I called How to Solve I the Israel-Palestine Conflict. Uh, right, but uh, the proposals that were made by the Palestinians in Annapolis in 2008, they said about 60% of the settlers can remain in place. It'll change a little because now there are more, more settlers. Enough. Yeah, about 60% will stay in place, but then there are other possibilities, and you have to keep them in mind. You mentioned correctly the large number of settlers there are being subsidized. And then you have to ask your question, what happens if the Israeli government ceases its subsidies? And then you have the fanatics, and that's true. And they asked one Israeli former security chief, well, what do you do about those fanatics? He says, it's very simple. All you have to do is tell those crazy settlers in Hebron, if you want to stay, stay. But we're leaving, meaning the army but is leaving. And you're, you're leaving this 400 comes back to Wizard of Oz stuff. You're it's living, never going to happen. No. The Israeli army is never going to abandon settlers. Well, I don't know why, leave you, them. Why, why you make that assumption. At the present moment, that's correct. Of history. At the present moment, that's correct because not very much pressure has been exerted on Israel. Israel has the first cost free occupation in the history of humanity. Okay. 
the uh, Palestinians do the dirty work, the Europeans pay the bills, and, Israel, and the United States blocks for them in the UN. So why should they leave? Okay, well, let's There's bring no in, incentive to leave. Let's bring in uh, Salma Kami, who is a Palestinian uh, lawyer and activist. Um, what's your view? Are you someone who still wants to have that independent Palestinian state that so many Palestinians have said they wanted? I think the one thing they were overlooking in this whole discussion about the logistics of whether the two-state solution is practical or possible is whether it's actually desirable from the Palestinian point of view. I think the problem that people need to bear in mind is that the Palestinian problem that needs a solution isn't confined to those Palestinians living under occupation in the West Bank and Gaza. So we need a solution that achieves rights for the Palestinian diaspora, for the refugees, and for those who are discriminated against in Israel. And the two-state solution patently doesn't do that. It's unfair because it only awards the Palestinians 20% of their historic homeland, and it doesn't actually address the wider issues which afflict the Palestinian population. So it's, it's not right in principle and it's not workable. What you want to look at is, in the broad public, in the international arena, what's the furthest you can go? And the furthest you can go, in my opinion, for now, is what you might call enlightened public opinion. And enlightened public opinion in the current world is mostly the language of international law, the language of human rights. So you look at the most representative organizations in the world today, and you look at what are their terms for resolving the conflict. They say two states. Here's what I don't get with you, Norman. Mm -hmm. You're someone who called Israel a lunatic state. Yeah. You called President Obama a stupefying narcissist, mm -hmm. devoid of any principles, every bit as wretched as his predecessors. Mm -hmm. You called the Palestinian Authority a gang of corrupt, wretched collaborators. Mm -hmm. And yet your solution to the conflict involves those corrupt collaborators doing a deal with that lunatic state under the supervision of a wretched narcissistic president. How does that work? Hey. I'm not so sure, those of you who are clapping, what would you have done during World War II? I'm no great fan of Winston Churchill. I think he was a monster in many ways. And what would you do with Mr. Stalin? But then you want to defeat the Nazis, and there was an alliance between Mr. Churchill and Mr. Stalin to defeat the Nazis. So what are you going to do? You're going to reject them both? And fine, then you'll have a Nazi rule in the world. You have to bring to bear pressure on the US government. And I think there are real possibilities now. Israel's stock has dropped precipitously in the United States, not just broadly, but even the American Jewish community. Norman, do you not see the mm -hmm. contradiction then in, their thinking, in your thinking? Because a few moments ago, you told us, you've told previous interviewers, that I work with the limits of public opinion. And yet mm -hmm. you're telling us that shock horror, public opinion changes. US Jewish public opinion changes. Public opinion changes all the time. Why mm -hmm. can't people make a case to shape public opinion, to change public opinion, to get people on board? Why say, this is what the public in America thinks, and this is the only deal the Palestinians can get. Why outsource the resolution of the Palestinian conflict to US public opinion? Well, I'm not outsourcing to US public opinion. I think US public opinion at this point is the weakest read. I think it's Euro European public opinion is quite powerful, and you, I think it's, you know, it's quite feasible that you can win over not only European public opinion, but it's important to keep in mind also European governments. I mean, as we speak, European governments are putting enormous pressure on Israel now on the question of the settlements. But do you see any European government? Can you name me one? One European government that's even hinted at one state? Name me one European government. Forget it. Let's not mention Norman, European on. governments. Norman, name me one government. Today, that mean name me hinted? one government in the whole world has the Islamic Republic of Iran called for one state? If you were around in the 1930s, what would you have said to Gandhi? You wrote a book about Gandhi. What would you have said to Mandela? Sorry, guys, give up the national liberation movement. Western public opinion isn't with you. No, no, give up all of that national liberation. No, no, Accept no, no, whatever Western no, no, public no. opinion gives you. You're, you're it's just, a very defeatist you're posture. You're just so way off base. It's unbelievable. Uh, you read... <laughs> you, uh, uh, you read Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi's standard was always where public opinion is. You don't go beyond public and opinion. Was public opinion uh, in favor of independent well, India in the 1930s? Uh, I don't think no, it was, Norman. Ga Ga we were entering the era of decolonization. This was be after World War I. And he said in that era, yes, that's something which is reachable, something within reach. He always calculated in terms of public opinion. But you and told the Salma is, that you've mm -hmm. got to stick with the two-state solution because that is where the limits I, of public yeah, opinion I, are. And I'm saying okay, that's not how the world no, works. When I said public opinion, I did not limit myself to the United States. I said the United Nations. I said 165 countries have embraced this solution. The problem is they've only done it on paper. 
And the challenge is, how do you turn passive support into active support? And I think there I agree with Gandhi, the way you, you turn passive support, which exists, including in the American Jewish community, the way you turn it into active support is you have to have mass nonviolent resistance in the occupied territories, like the first Intifada, which was remarkably successful, although it was aborted. It was a very successful first undertaking. Okay, our panel are agitated to come in. Jeff Halper, mm -hmm. you wanted to come in. Today, there is no traction to a one-state solution. The problem here is that we're thinking in a linear way. We're assuming that the status quo of today, the situation of today, is going to continue, and now how do we deal with it? This is a very dynamic situation. Uh, it's very likely, it's it, uh, certainly possible, that uh, the Palestinian Authority is going to leave the scene at some point. I mean, Abu Mazen himself is 80 years old. It could very well be the Palestinian, that, that uh, that there'll be a political collapse if the Palestinian Authority leaves the scene and Israel will have to reoccupy the Palestinian cities and maybe Gaza. Given a collapse, then that opens up possibilities for one-state solutions and other possibilities that don't exist today, which is true. And do you support a one-state solution? I support in all? it, and I think it's very doable, and not only is it doable, but it's the only way out, but it's going to have to wait upon a collapse in which, in which the, the, what we're talking about today becomes really irrelevant. One of the issues on which Palestinian public opinion is now switching, and a lot of Palestinian grassroots is coming behind, is the idea of a boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, the BDS movement, of a kind of South African anti-apartheid style movement to isolate Israel. You said Israel's occupation is cost-free to impose a cost on Israel. Is that something you support? Totally. I was for BDS before BDS existed. Any sane person would be for it. And yet a couple of years ago in an interview, you have now infamously referred to BDS mm -hmm. as a cult. You said mm -hmm. the people who joined BDS are part of a cult and they're responsible for a potentially historically criminal mistake. Yeah, because there's a difference between a tactic and a goal. The tactic is absolutely legitimate. And as I said, I've always supported the tactic. The problem is the goal. Ending Israel's occupation mm -hmm. and dismantling the wall, mm -hmm. recognizing the rights of Palestinian citizens in Israel, and respecting and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees. Mm -hmm. Which of those three goals do you object to? BDS put out its call in July 2005 to coincide with the first anniversary of the ICJ advisory opinion on the wall. And the very first statement of the BDS document says, we support international law. And they said the first right under international law is the right of peoples to self-determination. And from that right of self-determination, okay. they then derive three other rights. I say, of course, I agree with all of that. But Israel is also a state under international law. Israel still also has the right to self-determination and stated under international law. And then you have two options. One option is you have to recognize the reciprocal rights of Israel under international law because you say you're anchored in international law. Or, of course, you have the right to say to hell with international law. I think it's all nonsense. I think it's all made by rich people against poor people. But they have three sure, goals, as you sure, international law only when it concerns my rights. It's like saying I have the right to walk at the green, but I'm agnostic on the red. If you have a right to walk at the green, it's because you have an obligation to stop at the well, red. Hold on, hold on, you, can't, only you can't claim if, rights if they just said for yourself. They want to destroy Israel militarily. Then mm. you could say that's violating Israel. Mm. I'm not sure how demanding um, three rights which you agree me, with. Mackie, is Israel a state under international law? It's recognized by okay, international law. Yes. Fine, and where do fine. the BDS and not recognize be, Israel? And Ask them. I have you, asked them. Wait, wait. I have Mackie, asked them. I, do I you cannot, think I, it's an accident that Israel is not mentioned? Israel is Do you think it was an oversight? Oh, oh we forgot oh, about Israel? Oh, Norman, Norman. Is this serious? Really, Norman? They forgot For about Christ Israel. For sake. They forgot about Israel. Mm -hmm. Omar Barghouti, the uh, founder of BDS, yes. has pointed out that the majority of people on the boycott committee are two staters. That's absolutely correct. Which, which bit of international law do they not recognize? That Israel is a state under international law. Can you law. show me a statement where they say Israel isn't a state under international law? Show me a statement where they say it. I do show they you a say, statement. <laughs> Have you ever asked? Have you ever asked the BDS person where they stand on Israel? Yes. And what do they say? We take no position. Salma, you're not following international law by supporting yeah. this BDS campaign. The three calls of BDS are completely in line with international law, and the question of how you end up resolving the conflict, whether you have one state or two states, whether Israel is, is there still as a state or not, is actually a political question that international law is silent on. So there seems to be a lot of confusion about this role of international okay. law, and, and to my mind, it actually seems to be an excuse 
to attack the BDS, and I find that a really extraordinary thing to do when the Palestinians have very t few tools at their disposal at the moment to promote their rights and to promote solidarity with their cause. So I, I want to ask you actually, why would you use your platform, given the context that we're in, to attack BDS so, well, so vehemently? I, I'm talking about BDS with a capital B, capital D, and capital S. What I was asked about was the tools that are available to Palestinians. And I said, of course I endorse those pools, tools, and of course I used them and endorsed them long before BDS came along. But under international law, which you claim I completely misunderstand, doesn't Israel have the right to self-determination and statehood? Or are you telling me all I, the I, nations in the UN, the 196 I, nations which admit Israel as a member state, point. are suffering from a delusion? They recognize it politically. It's a that's state that's under international law. Jeff Alba, you support BDS. You're one of the rare few Israelis who actually thinks, yes, it's right to boycott my own country in order to put a cost on it, I believe. No, that's right. You know, we support BDS because um, BDS gives the people, in solidarity with the Palestinians, those tools to push the governments. If it hadn't been for the people, we'd still have an apartheid South Africa. The people were the ones that, that organized and pushed the governments to do what they should do. Governments will not do the right thing unless they're pushed by the people. Before I bring and Norman that's what back BDS in. is about. Before I bring Norman back in, Oliver, very briefly, you wanted to come back there. This is where the debate breaks down. Criticism of Israel is legitimate. Comparisons to the apartheid regime to institutionalize racial discrimination are tendentious and a disgrace. The moment you when demonize Israel in that when way, you say it's a you disgrace, are outside when you say it's a disgrace, the political Are you aware that the up. ANC, which led the struggle against apartheid, has endorsed BDS? Not all of them, by any means. Uh, Norman, do you regret now, two years on, mm -hmm calling the people who campaign for those three goals which you say you share, mm -hmm. Palestinians who see no other way of ending the occupation mm -hmm. than adopting an apartheid-like struggle, do you regret calling them members of a cult? I don't regret calling them members of a cult if they act like a cult. You see yourself as a radical. You said in a recent biographical film about your life called American Radical mm -hmm. that you see the world as a, quote, radically unfair place which requires a radical change. And yet, on Israel-Palestine, your position isn't radical at all. It's safety first, it's establishment friendly, it's pro the consensus of the UN Security Council and uh, other opinions. Mm -hmm. You're not radical on Israel-Palestine, you're quite conservative. You know, that's like saying we're facing a, a meltdown on the economy in the Western world. So you have to deal, what are you going to do about it? Okay, I'm going to be real radical. I'm going to advocate the abolition of money. Well, that's a really radical position. It really is. I mean, and according to Marx, that should solve everything because then we'll be in communism. But what does that radical position have to do with the real world? That's a cult. I want to make the world a better place. So I'm trying to look at the real material conditions in the real world, the real political limits that are imposed upon us, and figure out within those limits what's the maximum we could hope for. I didn't say the minimum. I didn't even say the moderate. I said, let's look at what the maximum is possible. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. We'll come back uh, in part two. We're going to take a break right now uh, on Head to Head. Join me in part two, where I'll be talking uh, to Norman Finkelstein about some of the personal battles he's had to wage, uh, especially with the Jewish community. And we'll also be hearing from our audience here in the Oxford Union. That's after the break. Welcome back to Head to Head on Al Jazeera. Uh, we are talking to Norman Finkelstein, the US author, academic, activist. Uh, Norman, you're a well-known intellectual. You've published several critically acclaimed, best-selling books. After your book, The Holocaust Industry, came out in 2000, you were accused of being a, quote, self-hating Jew. Uh, what's your response to that quite common, yet very serious accusation? Well, my response is a, a completely rational one. Let's say it's true, for argument's sake, that I'm a self-hating Jew. What does that have to do with the facts? I mean, if Einstein was a self-hating Jew, for argument's sake, that mean E does not equal MC squared? What do the facts have to do with what I am or what I'm not? If I were a self-loving Jew, would that mean everything I say is true? <laughs> so. <laughs> Do you think sometimes 
you maybe are your own worst enemy. You mm. are quite provocative, you're mm. quite controversial. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is part of the problem with Norman Finkelstein, that you pick fights with everyone and anyone and you end up doing yourself down? Well, first of all, I don't think politics is a popularity contest. But when you get too popular with the people, then there's probably some problem. And there is part of me that does believe that. I am not happy at all if there's any hostility from the people who are actually suffering, uh, namely the Palestinians. And I can see Ms. Carmi is not pleased with what I'm saying. And that does bother me, I have to tell you. The rest of the people, I couldn't care less. Your book, The Holocaust Industry, argues that the memory of the Nazi genocide in which most of your family perished mm -hmm. has been used to excuse Israel's behavior in the occupied territories, to mm -hmm. justify US support. It's an argument a lot of people make. It's an argument I'm sure many people in this room would agree with, people watching at home. But some people would say you phrased it, that argument in such an overly provocative, even offensive way. Look at the chapter headings, the book here. The double shakedown. Hoaxes, hucksters, and history. How can you say that doesn't play into anti-Semitic stereotypes? Well, it's kind of funny. I mean, just as a personal story, and I hope my publisher is not going to be offended, but when the book came out, it was, really, it was originally called Theory, Practice, and Examples, the three chapter headings. And he says, that's so boring, we have to <laughs> make it more exciting, because many people... <laughs> <laughs> and those chapter headings were cited by the, uh, my university when it denied me tenure, so I blamed him for the whole thing. But uh, <laughs> that aside, on a more serious note, when the book came out in 2000, I mean, it evoked a kind of hysteria. And now what I say is a kind of commonplace. So if you take the case of um, the former uh, speaker of the Israeli Knesset, Avraham Berg, he writes a book on the Holocaust. He refers to the Shoah industry. Now, when I use the expression, the Holocaust industry, it elicited all these horrors and shrieks and what are you saying, anti-Semitic, Holocaust denier, and now it's even a commonplace among Israelis to refer to a show, a show industry, place. yeah. In your own words, you once said, I've never been able to get a permanent teaching job in the US. What do you think that is? Uh, I'll simply say the facts, as I understand it, speak for themselves. Uh, if you take the example of the last place where I was employed, which was a university in Chicago, um, when they denied me tenure, the statement that they delivered upon denying me tenure s said that uh, Finkelstein has been an uh, excellent teacher and a prolific scholar. So uh, if I was an excellent teacher and I was a prolific scholar, uh, I shouldn't have been denied tenure. So why were you? Um, well, um, I think people have to draw that conclusion on their own many Jewish people claim that mm. you are anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. then I think that would be a problem for the Palestinian people, I think, who would see, who have seen you as a champion over the years. You were, as you say, very popular. Some people, one person called you a rock star. Uh, I think that would be a problem if it turned out that you're actually anti-Semitic. Actually, I think that would be a problem also. Uh, my own view is that I do more personally to fight anti-Semitism by my example in the Arab Muslim world than probably almost any other Jew that I know. Oliver, mm -hmm. Norman says that just by his example, just by writing this book, highlighting these issues, he's actually done more to combat anti-Semitism than most other Jewish public intellectuals. What do you say to that? That's not the view of, uh, of, of historians who reviewed his book. Uh, Peter Novick, the author of The Holocaust in American Life, um, described it as pure invention and compared it to the protocols of the elders of Zion. My criticism of Norman Finkelstein is slightly more prosaic. I have no problem at all with writers being provocative. It's what I am paid to do. But you're not very good at it. You're a hack writer. You made a factual error. Well, you're certainly entitled to your opinion. I don't know of any expertise. I don't know, opinion, I don't know, of, I don't know of any expertise you have in the topic. You understated by a large number mm -hmm. the number of Holocaust okay, survivors. Okay, that's the last question. Okay, very briefly. I would like to answer Very that. briefly, please. I don't claim at all to be an authority in the Nazi Holocaust. The book, The Holocaust Industry, is not about the Nazi Holocaust. It's a book about how the Holocaust has been rendered in popular opinion and in so-called scholarship. The figure I got of under 100,000 survivors of the Nazi Holocaust, it didn't come from me. It came from Raoul Hilberg. I think you'll agree if you have any knowledge of the Nazi Holocaust, which is doubtful, but if you have any knowledge of the Nazi Holocaust, you'll know that the world's leading authority in the Nazi Holocaust, bar none, was Raoul Hilberg. He was in a class all his own. Raoul Hilberg praised the Holocaust industry. 
In fact, he said my conclusions in the book were conservative. Now, Raoul Hilberg was begged by the U.S. Holocaust Museum and his close friend, Elie Wiesel, to remove his name from the book. And he said, no, I refuse to remove my name from the book because what Finkelstein wrote is true. He said Finkelstein's place in history as a historian is secure. And what was done to me was a travesty. So when you come along and say you're a hack writer, I attach as much value to that as I attach to the, to the dust on this floor. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Let's carry on. You both made your points forcefully. How do you make sure that you criticize Israel? This is an open question, kind of, I think people will be interested in knowing your take. How do you make sure that your criticism of Israel doesn't cross into anti Semitism? Because some people do. There are people who are anti Zionists and are anti Semites. There are people anti Zionists who are not anti Semites. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what your view is. I am, and I'm not trying to play the Holocaust card but I am the son of survivors of the Nazi Holocaust, real survivors, Auschwitz, Majdanek. Every single member of my family on both sides was exterminated during the war. I'm very sensitive to that charge. The Holocaust denier charge, I think, is like completely insane when it's applied to me, because anyone who knew me growing up would okay, say, if anything, I was a Holocaust affirmer, not a Holocaust denier, okay, i.e. I never question. stopped talking about it. As to your question, I think the problem is what do you do with motives? How do you divine a person's motive? And I don't know how you divine a person's motive. Yes, it's true that sometimes people are going to be making statements because they, they harbor anti-Semitic sentiments or har hardcore anti-Semites. And then the only thing you can do, in my opinion, is try to refute it on the basis of facts. Jeff Halper wants to come in. Jeff Halper from the mm -hmm. Israeli Committee Against House mm -hmm. Demolition. I just wanted to, to register a reservation about linking criticism of Israel to anti-Semitism. Israel is a country. And in fact, Israel, the whole idea of Zionism was we're not Jewish. We're Hebrew, we're Israelis. Uh, Jews are something else. Uh, the Jewish, you know, the, most Jews never went to Israel. You can't make Israel representative of Jews, and you can't hold Jews accountable for what Israel does. So I, I really think this, we're playing into what Israel calls the new anti-Semitism that was invented by the Israeli government that says any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism. I think we have to, to negate that, and, and therefore I just wanted to say here that I was a little uncomfortable with the idea that somehow criticism of Israel has anything to do really with anti-Semitism. <laughs> Is it easier, in your view, as an Israeli, do you think it's easier to criticize Israel inside of Israel than it is from outside of Israel? Is there of more course. criticism of the Israeli government at home than abroad? In Israel, just like in any other country, to criticize your governments is a, is a normal thing. I mean, if you criticize the Cameron government here, you're not okay. anti-British. And I think Israelis, you know, this is, a, this is a whole conversation that has to do more with the diaspora than it does inside inside Israel. Okay, well, let me, let me put that point to Oliver. Oliver, you write for a newspaper in the United Kingdom. Do you, do you agree with what Jeff's saying there about what happened, the criticism inside of Israel is much more ferocious and open than outside of Israel? I've never met someone who believes that criticism of Israel, of Israeli government policy, uh, much of which I've done myself, right. is inherently anti-Semitic. But the Israeli okay. foreign ministry, uh, about five, six years ago, consciously and deliberately developed a concept that's called the new anti-Semitism that says exactly that. Let me just bring in Salma Kami here. Who, you're a Palestinian uh, based in Britain. Do you feel, as someone who wants to kind of campaign for your people's rights, campaign against occupation, do you feel inhibited in what you can and can't say about the conflict? I think there is a certain inhibition for Palestinians and for those who are in solidarity with Palestinians, which is that whenever we want to talk about the nature of Zionism, or for example, the nature of the State of Israel as it is currently constituted, we run into this criticism that we're either anti-Semitic or that we're not respecting international law or that we're calling for the annihilation of the Israeli people when we're not. And we want to be able to have 
a legitimate debate about the principles that underpin the State of Israel and why they have caused so much suffering for the Palestinians and how the, continual, the continuance of Zionism is going to continue the conflict, in fact, and continue the dispossession of the Palestinians. But, whenever we, but when we try to do that, I, I'd say there are definitely people that, that shut down the debate by levelling this charge of anti-Semitism or delegitimization of Israel as well, as it's, as it's been called. Okay. Um, let's go to our audience here who've been waiting very patiently here in the Oxford Union. Raise your hands high and wait. Let's go to the gentleman here in the front row. Let's start with you in the red tie. I'm a Palestinian born in Nazareth pre-Nakba years. Therefore, I consider myself a Nakba survivor. As an architect, I use my metaphor, you never plaster over a crack, which begs my question. And that is, why do you and other colleagues, eminent people, try to plaster over the cracks of the Palestine issue, an issue that has started in the mid-1800s and manifested itself in the great tragedy in the 20th century, the Palestinian Nakba. I think going back to 1800 or going back to 1600, uh, it's sort of like, to me, it's like what the Zionists say, let's go back to when there was this Jew Judean uh, kingdom in uh, Palestine, I said, well, maybe there was, maybe there was, and I don't know, and frankly, I don't really care, because I just don't think it has much to do with trying to achieve a, a reasonable but resolution of the conflict now. Uh, the current political consensus calls for, they use the term, a just resolution of the refugee question based on 194, which is not exactly implementation of the right of return. And then we have a question. The question is, what's the maximum a political movement can extract politically from that legal right. If we can mobilize a powerful enough movement, we probably can extract more from that right. I'm gonna to go to the gentleman in the white jumper there on the third row back. Mm -hmm. Is there surely no strategy that Palestinians in civil society or their leadership could adopt to actually convert the cult-like international community support for a two-state solution into something towards a one-state solution? Well, at this point, Palestinian uh, political will, for perfectly understandable reasons, that will has been depleted. Uh, Palestinians feel hopeless, they feel cynical. Everything you can imagine, Palestinian people, like everybody else, are normal. And after suffering from so many defeats, there's going to be a large element of cynicism, hopelessness, and the every man for himself mentality. But are there possibilities? Yeah, I think there are very big possibilities. Let's take one example. If Palestinians were to march on the wall, with uh, a million Palestinians, we'll say, holding up a sign, enforce the law, dismantle the wall. Okay, you good. said I'm not a radical, and in some sense there's an argument there because I'm trying to find a slogan, a solution, which will resonate with most of world opinion. Enforce the law has a real possible resonance. So I think there are possibilities if Palestinians find the inner strength and I admit it, a lot of self-sacrifice in order to achieve you think, the goal. Do you think if they went up and with a million people stood up with signs saying one person, one vote, that wouldn't have an effect on the world? No, I don't think it will have, because if you hold up a, a, a sign that says you want to dismantle the Israeli state, you want one state, yes, it will have exactly zero resonance and in the yet, international community. And yet community. Ehud Olmert, former Prime Minister of Israel, said if Palestinians were to say one person, one vote, Israel is finished. Well, what Olmert said. Uh, yeah. Let's go back to the audience. Lady here with the scarf. Um, would you not, I mean, say that at this point, maybe it's a blessing in disguise that the two-state solution is falling out of public opinion because the unforeseen circumstances that might come from that will be like um, op oppression of the Palestinians and the Israeli state and more division between the Palestinians and the Israelis that will in the end cause more human rights violations in Israel itself. I don't know how the disappearance of the only, at this point, practical possibility for achieving some degree of justice in the conflict, the fact that it's not going to be possible, why, that would be a positive development. The fact that something is bad doesn't mean that something good is then on the horizon. It could be worse. Yeah. Let's go back to the audience. Gentlemen there. Thank you. Um, I think that the two-state solution that you are now proposing is basically is used kind of like to protect the Israeli interest. On, on the ground now by keeping the settlements without addressing the issue of the, pal of the Palestinian refugees and the issue of Jerusalem. Okay. It's, it's a kind of paradox, this kind of discussion, 
because I think it's forgotten that it was the PLO Executive Committee that endorsed the two-state settlement. It's like history is all being effaced and whitewashed. And now it's as if you're saying I'm some sort of collaborator or traitor because I'm endorsing the position which the Palestinians endorsed during the height of their self. If you read Shafiq al Hout, a respected former member of the PLO, he said we endorsed the two-state settlement during the height of our confidence and our belief in ourselves, namely during the first intifada. If the polls which show that every year the number of Palestinians who support a one-state solution goes up year after year after year, and by age, the younger you get, the more support there is. Mm -hmm. If tomorrow the polls show or next year or two years, majority of Palestinians, both in the West Bank and abroad, want mm -hmm. a one-state solution, one person, one vote, mm -hmm. will you support them in that? Uh, in, two, in 2001, 2002, in the occupied Palestinian territories, a majority of Palestinians supported the suicide bombings. Now, I, could, I can understand why they support the suicide bombing. I can understand the rage, the anger, and everything else. But in the name of supporting Palestinians, am I obliged to support the suicide bombings? Are you really comparing support that, for suicide bombings no, to I'm support saying, for one no, person, no, one vote? No, I wasn't. What I was saying, what I was saying was... What I was saying was the fact that the majority of the people might support a particular position doesn't compel me as a separate individual to embrace okay. that if I think it's unrealistic. Fine, I'll take that as a no. We're going to go to the gentleman right there at the back with his hand up. Yes, you, sir, you can stand up. Yep, you. Uh, I wonder, do you agree with Professor Norm Chonsky, who you know, thinks that language has a particular significance here and that the peace process being whatever John Kerry says the peace process is, you know, proves extremely corrosive, or that settlement sounds non-invasive? where in fact the reality is something rather more sinister. It's obviously not been a peace process, it's been an annexation process. So the peace process, at least the current phase of it, the current phase of it is said to have been initiated at Oslo in 1993. And then you look at the results. There were about 250,000 settlers in the occupied Palestinian territories in September 1993. The figure is now 20 years later, now it's about 550,000. So judging the process by the results, there hasn't been a peace process, there's been an annexation okay. process, and the Israelis and the Americans used the peace process as a fig leaf to conceal the annexation process. Back to the That's audience. correct. Uh, the gentleman here on the second row with his jumper on. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm a Palestinian. Now, uh, I'm confused, and I think uh, you are confusing all of us. Are you pro-Palestine? Or I'm not are pro you Palestine? Absolutely not. I'm pro justice. I have no interest in Palestine. Right. Or are, or are you an Israeli peace negotiator here? I'm not. Because I'm what, not either. Because what you are saying. I have no interest in causing... Let him finish his question, mm -hmm. then you can come back. Mind, Make your point. You are Very causing brief. a division amongst the internationally pro Palestinian activists mm -hmm. by not accepting or, by not, or by, by not respecting what they are demanding for. One state solution. Can you show me any evidence, a jot, a scintilla, a tittle of evidence? that the Palestinians uh, in, the, in the majority or their civil society organizations support one state. Where, where, where is that from? Show me the evidence. Okay, I'm Salma, curious. Let's briefly speak and I then mean, we'll go back to the audience. If you spent any time on the ground in Palestine or in the diaspora of Palestinian communities, mm -hmm. this issue would be obvious to you. When Palestinians are asked explicitly what do they think is politically viable, they've been fed on the two-state idea for so long, many of them will say, two states, we, you know, we can't imagine anything else. But if you ask them about the reality that they actually want, it's in accordance with the one-state idea. And if you presented them with okay. a strategy to achieve it, they would absolutely support okay, it. OK, we're going to go back to the audience now. Gentleman here in the front row. As you said, the majority of Israelis and Palestinians, as far as we know, do support the two-state uh, solution. However, do you think that some of your um, support for groups that support violence and rejection, like Hezbollah, um, actually doesn't support that majority of what you call, um, and I, I would agree, is progressive public opinion, actually undermines that and supports the rejectionists? Well, first of all, there's too many things attached to me which don't uh, reflect my own opinions. I don't believe a majority of Israelis support a two-state settlement. There isn't a scratch of evidence to support that. What the majority of Israelis will support is, uh, probably around 70% will support uh, a settlement of the conflict where Israel uh, annexes the, the settlement blocks, the major settlement blocks, and annexes most of Jerusalem and nullifies the right of return. That's what you, you find, uh, maybe as many in certain uh, polls, as many as 95%. But when you talk about an actual settlement on the June 67 border uh, and a Palestinian capital in East Jerusalem, a significant Palestinian capital in East Jerusalem, uh, the support goes down to 10 or 15%. I think the uh, point your critics would make is that a group like Hezbollah ain't so enthusiastic about the two-state solution, and yet you're 
right, willing to come out and defend them in public. Yeah, I think that's the, there's the no criticism. confusion here. I never said I support Hezbollah. Hezbollah has the right, and it did, uh, to my uh, to my thinking, uh, displaying an enormous amount of courage and heroism and discipline. They expelled foreign occupiers from their country. And why shouldn't we celebrate those occasions? I mean, in any other country in Europe, uh, the people who are part of the resistance, people who expelled the Nazis from their country, uh, we all celebrate the resistance. Well, why shouldn't we celebrate it? Uh, because they're Muslims. Let's go back to the audience. Lady there in the audience, second block there. You just said that you support violence before you said you support an anti-violent resistance. Could you please explain the contradiction? I don't consider it a contradiction. In certain circumstances, in my opinion, and I've studied Gandhi pretty closely, Gandhi's tactics can work in certain circumstances. They can't work in other circumstances. If you're in the middle of a forest in India, uh, and the Indian army is coming in and just wiping you out, nobody in the world cares, because nobody even knows what the heck is going on in that little forest in India. So nonviolence is not going to work there. But in a place like Israel-Palestine, where for historic reasons, Palestine is very much in the eye of the world, it's very much on the international agenda, in places like that, yes, I think nonviolent resistance can work. I do not think it could have worked in South Lebanon. Nobody gave a darn about Israel's occupation of South Lebanon, just like nobody gives a darn about Israel's occupation of the Golan Heights. Final question to you before we finish. You once said to some fans of yours, please don't put me on a pedestal because you'll end up being disappointed. Yeah. Do you think that's how a lot of people, not just in the Jewish community, but these days in the Palestinian community, feel about you, disappointed, betrayed even? I'm the same person as I always was. Uh, the only difference is it's not me that's changed. It's the international community, public sentiment. There's been a huge change, not least among the American Jewish community. And now you have something to work with. You have real possibilities, real hope that something can be done. And so uh, now I seem so moderate but the difference between me and many people in the BDS is I'm really happy about that fact. We finally have a breakthrough in public opinion. We have somebody to talk to. And other people think, well, no, that's not good. Let's strike a more radical pose. Let's try to be really radical. Let's be really chic. And let's be, especially when you've got tenure, you can be really radical. And so they start striking all of these radical poses, uh, which have no connection with reality. And they're so uh, defeatist of the cause. We have a real possibility now, the thing we struggled for for decades. We now have a public that's willing to accept the terms of a settlement, which as I said, the Palestinians themselves endorsed in 1988. And now we have a chance. And people are saying, ah, two states, passe, liberal Zionist, we need something more radical. And that to me is very frustrating because I think now we have real possibilities. Norman Finkelstein, thank you very much for joining us on Head to Head tonight. Thank, thank you. you all for being here. The debate will continue online. Join us next week here for Head to Head. Good night.